Now we are continuing with the CVM platform update, expanding the horizon with Bill Bittner, uh, who, as most of you know, is the CVM Labs focal point for client care. So it, it has a very close relation with most of our clients and he has good insights and try always to help where he can. So Bill Bittner, the stage is yours. Welcome everybody. It's great to be talking with you today. For those that may be listening to this in the recording, welcome to you as well. Uh, so I'm going to take you to the ZVM platform update, uh, expanding the horizon. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple different things. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the upcoming 7.2 release, uh, kind of review also the cadence and the number of releases that are out there today, and then sort of do a survey of some of the enhancements we've been doing, right, with our continuous delivery strategy. Areas that, that you see there. I also have a couple other highlights and a little bit of news that, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the presentation deck that I'll make available uh, later on will have additional charts in here than what I'll cover. Uh, we just sort of pared it down to some of the highlights for, for now. So let's start with the 7.2 release, right? So we did a preview announcement back in April. Um, so if you're not familiar with uh, preview announcements versus GA announcements, preview is kind of like I'm in a relationship. Right, I'm not setting a date yet or anything, right? But I'm in a relationship, so we intend to uh, produce a new release seven two, uh, and it was listed there in third quarter of this year. Uh, but you can think of it more as like September of of, of this year, right? And there will be a, a GA announcement uh, coming up here that we'll go into a little bit more detail. A couple of key things with that is uh, there is a new architecture level set. Right, so we're going to say Z13 or any of the Linux One machines or newer, right? Z14, Z15, uh, and so forth. Right, that's a trend that that I'll talk about a little bit here in terms of us being more aggressive with the architecture level sets. Now, with 7.2, we'll obviously include all the uh, SBEs or new function uh, PTFs that shipped to 7.1. They'll be in the base of 7.2. Right, I'll cover a number of them today. Uh, but there's there's also some additional ones out there. Uh, now, as we've talked about with this new uh, two-year release cadence, uh, most of the release will be a roll-up of the enhancements that shipped in the previous release. Uh, there are a couple exceptions to, to that. Um, so one of them is centralized service uh, management, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later on. And then there's also another session on that. Uh, and then... Uh, multiple subchannel sets, multi-target, peer-to-peer remote copy support for the GDPS environment as another item that's in the base. Now, both of those, if you think about them and as you learn more about them, you'll see where it makes sense that those really should be um, uh, set into a release, right? We don't really want to change how you'd service the system in the service stream, right? So that's why we're doing it. Uh, another little item there that I'll, I'll just mention briefly is something called adjunct virtual machine support, which we had actually shipped a while ago, but we didn't fully document it in the product. Uh, and this is probably more of interest to those of you that are, are ISVs or, or developing uh, systems on, on a ZVM environment, which essentially allows you to have an adjunct virtual machine, so a, a virtual machine that runs connected to your existing virtual machine and allows for some different debug capability and, and things of that nature, right? And so uh, really the key in, in 7.2 will be documenting that um, and how, how that could be used, right? Uh, additionally, there'll be some changes to the, the base in 7.2 that is foundational support for things that are coming in the future, right? So one of the things that we've had to, to balance with doing the continuous delivery and delivering all this new function in the service stream is service drag, right? And so the idea is that um, for some of the items that we know are coming that might introduce, say, a, a new module or routine in ZVM uh, or a new control block, we'll introduce them in the base of 7.2, basically as stubs, right, so that we don't have to impact as many parts when we actually ship that function. So there'll, there'll be a little bit of that as well. A few system default changes, right? And some of this is kind of under that umbrella of if the first thing we tell you to, is to change a default, 
that's probably not a good default value, right? Uh, and some of that is just because over time things change, right? So the first one here is T disk clearing, right? And so this is a setting that says um, uh, the ability to clear T disk uh, when it's, it's used, right? And so the default had been disabled in 7.2, that's going to be changed to, to enabled, right? That aligns better with security policies that are out there, right? And that's something that, that we want to be conscious of. Uh, another thing that pretty much everybody would change would be the Dermate need pass setting. Uh, that, that will now be a default of no to that. This next item is kind of interesting. So uh, the SRM unparking model, right? And so this has to do with the algorithms we have to determine how many processors we park or unpark uh, when we're running in a hyper-dispatched environment. And uh, a while ago, we introduced some new capability for you to influence uh, which of those algorithms or the uh, aggressiveness in which we unpark things, right? And at the time, when we introduced that, we, we kept things running just the way it always had been running, and that was with a setting of high. Right? And we didn't want to change that in the service stream because that might surprise some people. Right? But after the performance team has done uh, additional evaluation and we've gotten feedback from a number of clients, uh, it was determined that what we should do is, is change that default to medium. Right? And so we're doing that on the release boundary here in 7.2, uh, so, so be aware of that. Uh, similarly, when we put out support for the Z15 uh, and the Linux 1.3 boxes, right, part of what was included in there is support for system recovery boost, right, uh, or in some of the marking material, it was referred to as instant recovery, right. Now, essentially, that means a lot of things on different systems. From a ZVM perspective, what it essentially means is that uh, we will take uh, subcapacity processors and run them at full speed, right? When we're going down and when ZVM is IPLing, right? So uh, essentially allows us to uh, recover from an ABN faster or initially bring the system up quicker, right? Now, when we shipped that, we had it set up so that um, it was disabled by default and you had to enable it in the system config file. Again, that was another one where we didn't want to surprise you, especially folks that are doing things from an accounting perspective Right. If if I turn a subcapacity processor into full speed temporarily, that kind of could change depending on how you're doing chargeback and other things. Right. So we didn't want you to be surprised by that. Right. But now that, that it, we can have more exposure to it on a release boundary, it, it makes sense to do that. Right. Um, and so with 7.2, uh, that will be on by default. Uh, again, obviously, it requires a Z15 or newer and that appropriate configuration. So those of you that are running in an all IFL environment, it doesn't mean anything because those processors are already running at, at full speed. Okay. Uh, a couple other changes that, that we made. Um, one is um, an IPL parameter. So paging 6.3. And so this is actually a parameter that you pass into ZBM when you IPL it, right? So it's not a system configuration setting. Back when we did ZVM 6.4, we drastically changed the paging algorithms and the paging structures. Um, and even though we, we felt we were doing due diligence and testing and everything, we felt that we wanted to have a chicken switch or a, an easy way to go back to the old algorithms, right? And so we put in this paging 6.3 parameter, right? Now, um, with that, though, as we continue to make additional changes to the system, we find that we have to dual path or at least do design research to determine some things. And since we really haven't had to use that paging 6.3, in fact, I can't recall any instance after the first six months of, of 6.4 going out that, that we used it, uh, we're going to drop that in, in 7.2, right? So you'll no longer have that, that option there, right? And that was an option where we documented that you should really only use it uh, with feedback from IBM support. So we feel pretty comfortable with that. Uh, another kind of change in 7.2 is, is ERA. So the Environmental Record Editing and Printing Program, uh, you used to have to install that as part of the whole install process for ZVM, right? And it was kind of a pain. So what we're doing in 7.2 is 
uh, the executable parts of that that you need, uh, they will be there as part of the base 7.2 installation process, right? So simplifying some steps for, for you from that, also ensuring that, that things are there when needed. Okay, so that was 7.2 and, and kind of the, the, the backup for that or the, the background for, for what's going on there. Let's look a little bit at just, again, reviewing our release cadence, right? And so sort of what we decided uh, starting with 7.1 was that we would have a new release every two years, um, and it would be in even years, right? So remember, ZOS is odd years, ZVM is even years. They have the same sort of, of approach to this. Uh, and it would be in the third quarter, which typically ends up being September, right? Um, and so uh, 7.1 uh, went out September of 2018. So uh, upcoming here, we'll have a new release, 7.2 uh, GA in, in this third quarter. Now, a couple of things to note that are different from the past is that you see when 7.2 GAs, 7.1 will still be orderable. Right, so so that's one change from from the past of, of what we used to do. Uh, now another thing that will change is that we've been putting out new function only to seven one, right? So we haven't been putting back the new function back on six four, right? You're going to see that stop now, right? So the things I covered today are the last kind of new function things that are going out to seven one as it transitions into a, a more stabilized release where we will be putting out RSU's corrective service. Uh, and assuming that there's new processors or new hardware support, uh, we'll put that out. Now, we may not put out support for every bit of hardware, like new tape drives or things like that, but the, the major things will we'll put support out for 7.1 on that, right? And you'll see that we've announced um, that the end of service for 6.4 is going to be March 31st of next year, right? So part of what this is going to do is line you up, some of you up that, um, if you're a little leery about being on the leading edge, you can stay back. So from 6.4, you could then migrate to 7.1, right? It's still orderable there, right? Others of you are going to probably want to go to 7.2 right away. Others of you may want to wait until we ship something on 7.2 that is really of interest to you, right? And so we'll continue to do this market um, 7 for quite a while. And then after about four and a half years, so out here, you know, first quarter of 23, we haven't announced it yet, but you can anticipate an end of service for that, right? So one of the questions I get from some of you that are on 6.4 now is, well, Bill, should I just wait to go to 7.2 um, or should I go to 7.1 now, right? And the answer, say it all together with me is it depends, right? Um, so it depends on the hardware you're on, Right, because remember 7.2 has that new architecture level set. Uh, you may not be able to run 7.2 on your current hardware. Again, we're IBM, we'd be more than happy to sell you a, a newer machine uh, to get to that. Also, some of it depends on um, how quickly and what your structure is to go to a new release, right? So um, those of you that need a longer runway to migrate, uh, remember that 6.4 will go into support uh, March 31st. Uh, and so you want to be off that. And, and 7.2, you now have a better idea of when that's going out. Right. So this is our, our basic strategy. There's a few exceptions to this. Uh, but overall, that, that's the approach that we're taking. Uh, the PTFs that we ship with new function, we tend to kind of group them um, in a group each quarter. Uh, that just makes it a little bit easier for us to test and hopefully uh, from an implementation perspective as well. All right. Um, and then just a kind of a reference chart for you in terms of the releases when they GA, the end of, of marketing and end of service, uh, as well as what uh, hardware they support uh, on that, right? Okay. Uh, the continuous delivery page, you know, I've talked about this uh, idea that we shipping a lot of new function in the service stream. Uh, for those that haven't heard about the continuous delivery news page or what a lot of us refer to as the new function page, based on that, that's what the URL is, um, take a look at that, right? It's one that I recommend all the VMers out there uh, have on their notify list, right? So if you uh, go to any of the pages on the VM homepage, on the left nav bar, you'll see a place that says notify me, right? And by clicking that and putting in your email address, 
uh, you'll get a reminder anytime that page is updated, right? And this is really the page where we're describing all the new things we're working on and even some of the things that we're just thinking about working on, right? We'll also update that with information about um, when is it available, what are the PTF numbers, what does it do, what sort of compatibility uh, implications might it have. Uh, any interactions with hardware or software will be listed there, right? So that is also an opportunity for you to take note of those things. And if there's something that really interests you, you might want to become a sponsor user. And, and I'll talk more about the sponsor user program uh, later on in, in the presentation. Okay, so um, now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about these uh, focus value areas, right? So I'll, I'll pull out a different item for each of these uh, to talk about or, or, or multiple items. So uh, scaling uh, and TCO, right, that's kind of our bread and butter here, part of virtualization in general, uh, having a, a robust hypervisor that allows us to, to run a lot of things on top of it. Uh, also, we'll talk a little bit about resource management. Uh, and some aspects that, that fall into play there that are important, as well as security. Um, some would argue that I should have security number one here, uh, but I, I kept in the middle uh, as part of the meat of the sandwich here. Uh, resiliency and RAS, right? We want to talk about some items there as well, right? And then lastly, improving systems management or, you know, as I jokingly say here, keeping the system programmer happy, trying to, to make life easier for them. Uh, now, Many of the items that I talk about, I list them under one of these value areas, but you could argue that many of them fit under multiples of them, okay? So let's talk with improved scaling in TCO. And this is really just that idea of how many virtual servers can I fit in a given footprint, right? And how efficient can I run that environment? So obviously part of that is continuing to keep up with the hardware. Uh, the better price performance points of these machines. Uh, and so when we came out with the Z15, uh, and more recently, the newer models of that, the uh, LT2 and the, the TO2 uh, for, for those families, uh, we made support for that. Uh, one little kind of note, the, the Linux one, the nomenclature for those have changed a little bit. Um, we used to call the larger ones emperors, as in the emperor penguin, the largest penguin. Uh, and rock hopper being the smaller uh, penguin, right? Uh, we've done away with those names in the Linux 1.3 uh, family. And so they're just all referred to as, as Linux 1.3s uh, with different model numbers in there. Now, one of the things we also introduced was uh, quite a while ago for the Z14 family, I think it was, uh, was this web page that gives you more details on what the requirements are for that, right? Both from a, either a 6.4 or 7.1 perspective. Um, included on that page is a file that you can download and run a says command against, which will, will then uh, validate that you have all the service required uh, to run the new machines on your system. And there's a few other hints and tips there and some pointers to uh, things like the, the PSP bucket and, and things of that nature. Right now, as I said, uh, we put new support for the hardware out uh, not only on the current release, but the previous one as well, right? And so there are PTFs both for 6.4 and for 7.1 uh, for the Z15 and the newer Linux One boxes. Uh, and they have the, the capability for uh, the items listed here uh, on that. Um, so one of the things that, that there's been a little bit of news in the mailing list about some of the uh, on-chip data compression. Uh, so that compression and the instructions for that aren't new, but the efficiency and, and the implementation of, of that is new on the Z15 uh, and showed some, some pretty promising performance benefits there, uh, as well as improvements to uh, other aspects of the system that were done on, on 6.4 and 7.1. Uh, the one exception to this is the system recovery boost that I mentioned earlier, right? So that's the ability to bring the general purpose processors that are subcapacity up to full capacity for a limited time you know, typically when ZM is initializing or, or shutting down or, or going through admin processing, right? And that will be there mostly to benefit those of you that have VSE gas or TPF gas that have those environments. Now, since that was a fairly unique new function, that was only for 7.1. So that support didn't go back to 6.4. Uh, and again, remember on, on 7.1, you would need to enable that explicitly Whereas in 7.2, the defaults change where you would pick that up uh, automatically. 
So one of the other things that we did um, last year, a couple months after the last VM workshop, was we released support for any logical processors, right? Um, and this kind of boggles my mind in some ways in that, you know, a, a six-way was a big system when I started, right? It was a very big system when I started, right? And so now we're up to any logical processors. Now, bear in mind that when we're looking at an SMT-enabled uh, environment, um, we're having potentially two threads or two logical processors per core. So that means with, with this support, you could have up to 40 cores with SMT enabled, right? Um, now there are some requirements in terms of how many logical processors will support based on the processor families as well, right? That's for, for various reasons. There are um, new enhancements in these machines that we've been taking advantage of to get the scalability. Uh, the other thing that often comes up is people say, well, Bill, why why 80 processors? That seems like a, a, a unique number. Why not 128 or something like that? Uh, this, again, is a space where ZVM is a little different in that uh, we could probably let you run 128 processors, but you probably wouldn't run very well, right? And so we set our support limits to things that are, are practical and safe for you. Right, and so that's why we did that. The other thing was we engaged our sponsor users from this perspective, right? And when we looked at this and, and started seeing where the end weight curves start to, to bend back down, uh, any logical processor seemed like the right place. And in engaging with the sponsor users, they said that was a big enough number to keep them going for now, right? So in the old days, we might have delayed the item until we got to that larger number, right? Um, this way we can get to you what you need when you need it. Uh, and I think that's important, right? Uh, so that, that shift that's on 7.1, obviously in the base of, of 7.2. Uh, another little item that I'll, I'll mention briefly here is fast erase for 3390 disk or ECKD type uh, technology, right? So basically a, a change um, that can be exploited by things such as Dermate um, to speed up the, the formatting and erasing of data on this, right? So just a little thing that we were able to do, but um, pretty significant size or performance improvement uh, from that. Uh, another thing that we're looking at in terms of, of scalability, uh, and we have looked for sponsor users for this, is four terabyte of main memory or real memory support, right? So right now the limit is two terabytes. We're looking to double that. Uh, sometime after we get done 7.2, the, the team will be working on that or continue working on that. Um, right now, we will keep the guest limit. So individual virtual machines would still be the uh, have a limit of one terabyte, um, but we would be looking to, to, to double the real memory support for that. Again, that would only be on a 7.2 item uh, when that comes out. Okay, so I talked about uh, TCO and scalability, right? And And so... Sometimes the analogy I use here is uh, how many balls can you juggle, right? And so scalability is about how many balls can I really keep in the air and keep going at the same time. Now we're kind of looking at a space of, well, you know, anybody can juggle a bunch of tennis balls, but can you juggle a bowling ball, a tennis ball, and a ping pong ball, right? Or we can maybe throw a chainsaw in there too if, if you want, right? So that takes a little bit more work, right? And it's the same sort of thing in terms of, uh, keeping a system running that is all four gigabyte virtual machines all doing the same thing is one thing, but how do you deal with a, a more diverse in, environment? Uh, and so uh, we try to focus in this area as well, right? One of the things that, that we've been working on that I think will help in, in that environment is dynamic memory downgrade. So a number of years ago, we did dynamic memory uh, upgrade, which allowed you to dynamically add memory to a running ZVM system. What this item will do is allow you to take memory away. Um, now, as you can imagine, it's a lot more difficult to take memory away from a running ZVM system than it is to add it, right? And this is an item that's an, another good um, testimony to the interaction with our sponsor users in terms of us trying to get it right, right? And, and meet all your requirements. Uh, so as a result, this, instead of shipping something that um, wasn't perfect for you, we're delaying that so that we can get some of those things improved and, and meet some of the things that, that you're looking for, right? Uh, so that, that's one item. There's been some of the things we, we've done in that space, which I, I won't talk about here, uh, but things like the B-switch priority queuing, 
uh, those sorts of things, uh, I deal with that. Uh, to some degree, I, I probably could have included the uh, SRM on parking values in there because that allows us to adjust to different kind of environments uh, from that perspective. Okay, so uh, security, enhanced security is another item here. Um, yeah, everybody can juggle, but can you juggle while other people are trying to smack the balls away from you uh, or throw things at you, right? That's a little bit more difficult. Uh, this first item here, I, I listed more from an example perspective than actually dwelling on the individual items here. Uh, but if you think about it, um, now that we're doing a, a new release every two years, that's a little bit different approach. So uh, many of you in the past uh, would come in maybe with a problem or an enhancement idea, and we would say, hey, you know what, why don't we just put that in the next release? We'll open an internal problem and do that. Well, now with releases being two years apart, right, that could be a longer time waiting for that. And actually, if, if an item like that came in today, um, it wouldn't make sense too, right? And so it would be even more than two years. So what the security team and, and RACF development team came up with was uh, periodically, they're gonna do kind of a PTF that's a fix pack, right? So a collection of usability enhancements or improvements, right? And so the one I, I have here from, from last year um, is an example of that. So lots of little different things that improve the system, right? Um, and this was, was part of the feedback that we had gotten from, from you clients is that um, we shouldn't just spend focus on the really big items. We shouldn't forget about the little things that make life better for everybody, right? Um, even if, you know, you can't make a marketing brochure about this, there's still good things. Um, and if, we make you better at, at your jobs as system programmers. That means it's easier to manage the system. And if it's easier to manage the system, I can run more virtual machines or more LPARs, right? Uh, so, so that's just an example there. Some of the other teams are, are looking at this approach as well uh, or have, have already done it, right? Uh, so watch for that. Um, a, a bigger ticket item is multi-factor authentication, right? So. Uh, the ability for different um, authentication credentials to be used uh, rather than the traditional password and passphrases, right? And this is going to be a, a combination of, of things, right? So there was a newer product. Uh, I don't want to say it's new because it's been there from a, a ZOS uh, solution perspective, uh, the IBM Z multi-factor authentication product, right? Um, also in conjunction with a security manager, uh, that supports this, so either RACF from IBM uh, or BM Secure from, from Broadcom, uh, as well as some changes to CCPIP and some things that went out in CP previously uh, will allow support for this. So, in Hogenbrook, uh, we'll be taking you through a session on this, uh, as well as the Broadcom update later today, I believe it's 12.30 today, uh, the Broadcom team talk a little bit about uh, their uh, aspect of this as well, right? So again, making security more important for, for everybody. So in that kind of, of same spirit, um, there were some improvements to the TLS SSL uh, certificate verification, right? So allowing uh, better authentication and checking of these things, uh, introducing some new APIs to provide additional information for those that understand this space. Um, there is a user session uh, later this week, uh, tomorrow at, at 3 o'clock. Um, uh, we have a mystery user that will we'll talk about their experience in setting up uh, some of this environment. Um, and so trying to improve that. And we also have another sponsor user item there, uh, continuing to improve some of the certificate management uh, that you might want to check out. Uh, but we know that this is important to your environments, and, and so we want to continue to improve that. Um, and along that space, um, a lot of people leverage CMS pipelines, uh, whether you're running it yourself or you're utilizing other applications or tools or, or products that use that, right? And so we also engage clients from an SSL perspective for pipelines. Um, so Rob Vanderhey, who's the, the keeper of the pipelines now in, inside the product, uh, has made a number of enhancements there. Again, working with customers. So essentially trying to uh, allow your CMS applications that are using pipelines to use secure connections to do that, right? And so um, I, I think that's really cool. What's also kind of interesting in this is there's a, a couple items here that are highlighted with asterisks as um, 
when we began the sponsor user discussions, additional things came out, right? And so uh, as this has shipped uh, this month, uh, that's available and it, it's better than uh, it, it would have been because of, of that additional feedback from customers, right? Where in the old model, we would have shipped it and then waited two more years to, to get these additional things in, right? Uh, so so that, that that's pretty significant. Um, so essentially some compatible uh, enhancements to a couple of the stages there and just allows you to do a, a lot of things. I'm, I'm very um, interested in seeing what you all do with it. Right, there's been different discussions and different people uh, using things such as connecting in CMS things to Slack channels uh, or tying it in with GitHub securely, uh, being able to pull data from the internet uh, securely. Uh, all those things allow um, additional tools and capability in, in your toolbox uh, for these applications. So an exciting space there. Okay, so. Um, ending up the security uh, aspects, we're going to talk about resiliency and RAS. Uh, so if I keep with my juggling analogy, uh, what happens if one of the balls drops? Or what happens if I get tired? Is there another juggler ready to step in and, and take over for that, right? And being able to do that uh, reliably, right? So one of the things we did last September, um, and, and you could argue that this fits in the security bucket as well, is dynamic crypto. Right, so for the crypto adapters, um, so Crypto Express uh, hardware features, uh, those were items that we still needed to do, um, often shut down ZVM to make changes to, right? So with this support that went out for 7.1 in the base of, of 7.2, uh, you can now do uh, your changes dynamically uh, with the crypto environment. Uh, this was another good example of good sponsor user feedback where um, we made some additional improvements to it, right? So some additional information, for example, in the query commands. Also, a result of that was a whole new chapter uh, in planning and admin for that, right? So I know there's a, another session uh, later this week uh, looking at the Crypto Express hardware in general. Uh, Andy Hartman from Mainline Insurance will be covering that. Uh, so you can also listen to that or check out the recording for that. I don't know that he'll go into a lot of detail with the uh, ZVM Dynamic Crypto support. Uh, he's going to be focused more from a Linux perspective, I, I believe, there. right? But but that was a good item that, that went out, again, in the base of, of 7.2. Um, something else that's in the base of 7.2 uh, is this uh, MSS multi-target PPRC support for GDPS environment. Right, and so this is the idea that um, in some of your environments, because of the level of resiliency you want, um, you not only want a secondary device, but you want multiple secondary devices. Um, so that when I'm copying data, um, moving it to uh, multiple uh, devices and copying that, right? And also having those secondary devices um, in alternate sub-channel sets, right? So as our, our um, address space uh, economy changes, uh, we needed to be cognizant of, of that as well, right? Um, which again, befuddles my mind as I think back as to, you know, uh, even the idea of having multiple uh, sub-channel sets to begin with, right? Uh, so this is a, a, an item in 7.2, uh, introduces a number of changes to uh, how devices are looked at and, and managed. So its primary requirement, uh, as I said here, is in the GDPS environment, right? Uh, also the capability of, of dealing with um, a number of, of, of configuration changes there, right? So look for more details on that when it comes out. Okay, um, improve systems management or you know, uh, system programmers or people too, right? So some things that we've done there. Uh, centralized service management, right? So uh, this is the idea that uh, we want you to apply service and we want you want it to be easy to apply service, right? So in an SSI environment, that was part of, of what we baked into that to where I can apply service once in the cluster and then separately, you know, put the prod uh, across that cluster. Now, um, one of the things that, that came out was that um, there are, are clients who have more than four systems, right? Which is, is the limit of an SSI cluster uh, and or 
they have systems that span the globe, right? And when we typically think about an SSI cluster, we're thinking about maybe on the same raised floor, maybe you know, cross town, but not typically cross world, right? And so wanting to have that capability of applying service once um, and then putting it into production uh, elsewhere. And so that's what the centralized service management support is in 7.2, uh, which will allow you to have a, a what we'll refer to as a principal system that sort of manages the different distinct levels of service and then manage those to remote systems, uh, transferring them securely over TCP IP. Right. And so uh, Richard Lewis has a session on, on that um, Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, so you want to check that out or listen to the recording for that where he'll go into a little bit more detail and, and uh, get you uh, used to that terminology uh, in that environment. So that, that's a, a pretty exciting item. Uh, it's a pretty big item as well. Uh, so the team is focused a lot on that. Uh, and we do have, a, again, a number of sponsor users that are working with us on that that I, I want to thank. OK, IBM Wave for ZVM. So again, in that systems management space, uh, I wanted to mention that, that IBM Wave uh, also has a continuous delivery uh, model, right? And so they recently came out with a fixed pack uh, back in April, uh, which added some additional support for RHEL 8 guests as being managed, uh, also support for the new hardware. Uh, also, um, it's kind of interesting. So in the IBM Z space, you know, it's been drilled into us about forward compatibility, right? Well, that's not always the case everywhere else. Right, so one of the databases that can be used with with IBM Wave had an incompatibility, which uh, we needed to deal with. Right, so that's covered there in that Fix Pack 15. Um, so, so watch again for the continuous delivery of of Fix Packs coming out from an IBM Wave perspective. Uh, so, IBM Wave, uh, along with four other products, are available in what we call the infrastructure suite for ZVM and Linux. Right, and so that's the idea of um, being able to get these five products by ordering a single PID, right? Makes it a little bit easier. Uh, there are some also um, uh, price benefits from that as well, right? So IBM Wave is the middle product there. Uh, the two above it, Omegamon XE, um, has both a ZVM and a Linux component to that. So Omegamon is a performance management tool, which has uh, essentially an agent for pretty much anything out there. Uh, so DB2, Oracle, ZOS, et cetera. I can tie that into a, a single pane of glass to do that. And so with the, the uh, product that's part of the infrastructure suite, uh, as I said, you get both the VM agent uh, to get the VM information and then a Linux agent that you can run in your Linux guests as well. Uh, and then Spectrum Protect, which some of you probably know as typically Storage Manager, and, and some of us may even remember it as ADSM. Right, is the, the file level backup and recovery for the Linux virtual machines themselves, so for the, the Linux data. Right, that's part of the suite. Um, down below, uh, from a VM perspective, you have backup and restore manager for ZVM, right, which will do both you know, image and file level backups there. Um, and then joining that is operations manager, uh, which does your, your scheduling, automation, monitoring, and different things of that nature, tying all these pieces together. Uh, so those five are, are part of that infrastructure suite. Uh, and then if you have tape drives involved, there's a separate product that can uh, integrate in with those to, to manage that. Uh, so uh, later this week, uh, Thursday at 3 p.m., Tracy Dean will be doing a session on customer experiences. Uh, in that, she goes over a number of different uh, problems customers have faced and how they used um, uh, use that, uh, use these different products or similar products to, to solve that, right? Okay, so I see there's been some quite a lot of good dialogue here in the chat. Um, the Spectrum Protect is at the client support only. Um, so uh, that I don't know offhand if Tracy's on, I'll, I'll let her answer that or we'll, we'll follow up with, with you on that. It is only for the Linux perspective, right? Um, the uh, it's not there for the VM files or CMS files. Okay. Um, now the the new kid on the block in this space is the IBM Cloud Infrastructure Center, which Kara Todd in, in the keynote session had, had mentioned. 
Uh, and we'll also have a, a session late, later this week in more detail on that. Uh, but if you're familiar with all the as a service type solutions, this one fits in the space as infrastructure as a service, right? And it allows you to manage the infrastructure, including a, a ZVM aspect of that um, through a, a user interface that's graphical, right? It also has the ability to integrate in with other uh, cloud automation tooling, right? Which you'll see here. Now, uh, Steve Glodowski is the offering manager for that. Um, and he has a session Friday, uh, Friday at 1 p.m. Uh, so Steve is from Boblingen, Germany. Uh, so it would actually be a happy hour for him over there. So if you want to spend happy hour with somebody from Germany uh, talking about infrastructure as a service, uh, that's a great session for you. Um, so, so take a look at that, and he'll go into a lot more detail there uh, as to how that fits into the space. But as you see that we continue to, to focus in this area, and provide different solutions. Okay, another thing I wanted to mention that, that um, hopefully should be helping you all out um, is our, our ZVM homepage, the library section of that. Uh, now, last time at the workshop, I talked about how uh, parts of IBM had been getting rid of old manuals or, or access to them on the web. Uh, we heard you, we've kept them there. So everything is archived out there from a ZVM perspective uh, for these releases. Um, and if you think about it, if, if we're putting out new function every quarter, that means the books are changing every quarter as well, right? And so we want to be able to address that. Uh, the thing that is new, I believe, since when I, I talked to the workshop last, uh, is there's now also a tab there for presentations, right? So there's a number of presentations which we've committed to keeping updated, right? For example, this presentation, I probably update every quarter, if not more often. Right. And so instead of, of going to an old version uh, from a different conference or so forth, you can go to that presentation and make sure you have the, the, the latest news there. Right. Uh, so that's our commitment to doing that for a subset of these presentations. So, so check that out uh, when you get a chance. OK, a few other highlights I just want to touch on briefly. Uh, sponsor users. I, I've talked about that a lot. Um, and I, I can't uh, thank you all enough that have been sponsor users. Uh, for your your feedback and your help in this in making the products better, right? So I probably should change that quote to I not just helped build ZBM, I helped build a better ZBM, right? Um, and we get, uh, you see different examples there of the kind of feedback we've gotten, uh, but it, it really has improved things. You get involved earlier, uh, for those that aren't involved with sponsor users, um, program, you get involved uh, potentially at the concept phase, right? So before any code's been written or any real design's been done, we just start talking about the pain points and how we want to address this, right? So you see a URL there with some additional information. Uh, also, Kerry Wilson is our coordinator for that. Uh, part of how you can get connected is look at that new function webpage I mentioned earlier, right? See if you see an item there that, that's exciting to you. Um, one of the questions I get the cost to be a sponsor user well you're not sponsoring you know a, a vm developer uh, for a month you know for five dollars a month or anything like that uh, the program is free from that perspective uh, but there is a time commitment potentially a resource commitment in terms of doing testing if that's what's required um, and that's not always required there's there's some items where it's uh, more in depth in terms and others where we're looking for your help more in, in terms of some of the um, testing aspects of it. Uh, you do need a feedback program agreement. Um, those are, are ones where once you get it, you're good. You don't have to renew it for every, every new project you work on, right? Uh, so that's good. Uh, so a couple items I just want to call, call out here. Here's a list of different items where we're looking for sponsor users. Um, some of the newer ones I, I'd call out is uh, the first one there, so the CP new function interrogation API, right? So this came up from the idea of, well, if we're shipping all this new function in the service stream, how do I know if it's there and how do I know if I want to exploit it? And how do I do that programmatically, right? And so um, we're looking at a, a, a approach to do that and provide that capability. Uh, we do have a number of people involved already, but we could use a, a few more eyes on that if you're interested. Um, Another one there is the ZXC architecture support. Uh, so we do have ZCMS that we've supported for quite a while. 
But what's missing there is the ability to run in an XC mode virtual machine. And so if you run with ZCMS, you lose some of the benefits of things such as VM data spaces, right? So things like SFS, dirt control, uh, data space backed um, <clears throat> directories, uh, the performance benefit for that is, is lost. Uh, and then the last item I'll just call out is there's a team that just started meeting to look at um, how do we provide some education and fill in the gaps for some of the existing education that's out there uh, via either videos or, or other media. Uh, so if you're interested in any of those, uh, Carrie Wilson, who, whose email was listed on the previous page, or myself, just contact us and, and we'll put you in, in touch. Okay, and then uh, finally, for another vehicle for working with us at kind of a, a broader scale is the ZVM Council, right? And I just realized uh, earlier today that um, we're working on our third year now uh, in this, this program, right? So just finished our, our second anniversary. Um, and so it's a group that meets once a month for about 90 minutes, uh, and we cover a number of different things. Uh, on some of the meetings, we'll cover project proposals in terms of new things that either you think we should be working on or we're thinking about working on. Uh, there are times where we'll do client playbacks. So even if you're not a sponsor user for a particular item, we'll give you a glimpse as to what's going on with that item, right? And look for your feedback there. There is time we'll give you some homework or we'll do some user research. Uh, we did one not too long ago about um, your scalability plans, right? How fast are you growing? Uh, how fast have you been growing, right? Which is good feedback for us in terms of, of you know, that four terabyte line item, the any logical processors work we did. Uh, that was all beneficial for that. Uh, and at times we'll do a prioritization exercise. So we recently did one of these back in February. Uh, where we had you sort of rank um, all the things on our to-do list or our wish list. Um, and that helps us guide uh, guide us as to what we work on next, right? So again, Kerry Wilson coordinates that and there's a URL there if you want some additional information. You do need a feedback program agreement. Um, a couple of things I've had people comment on is, uh, well, Bill, I haven't been in ZVM long enough to be worthy of being on the council. Not true. Some of the best insight we get are from some of the people that are newer to the product. Uh, likewise, I've had people that say, well, Bill, we only have three LPARs. We're not big enough to count. Nope, uh, small customers count too, because our goal is that small customers will become big customers someday, right? Or we learn a lot from, from the, those environments. So I've been excited about the demographics and the diversity we've had in this council in terms of different shops there. So uh, I'd like to see that grow. All right, so there were some statement of directions that were made in the preview announce, and there'll be some additional ones coming up in the, the GA announce. Uh, there's one that I want to just mention here, uh, just because we want to be careful about this one. So we did have a statement of direction that in 7.2 would be the last release where we would have support for sharing your RACF database between a ZVM system and a ZOS system. Uh, so after 7.2, um, a future release will, will not allow that, right? Um, so if you're doing that, you know, let us know. Um, we want to talk to you about that. Um, now, this doesn't mean if, if you're sharing your RACF database across multiple VM systems, that's fine. It's just this aspect of sharing it with a, a ZOS system, right? Um, so we want, want to be cognizant of that. All right, so let me pause here to see if there's any questions or, or if you do have questions. Uh, now would be a good time to, to share them. So kind of looking over, um, looks like there's some good discussion here. I don't see any questions that haven't been answered, Bill. You're good. Okay. All right, well, so if there, there's no other questions, um, you know, I wanted to thank you all. You know, I, I, as I've been thinking about uh, both my career and the product, um, and especially the last couple of years, I, I've had this this vision of, um, you know, things expanding. Um, also was triggered a little bit by, uh, with this isolation during the pandemic, I had time to clean out some closets. Um, and one of them, I found some old photographs and, and some of you may remember way back, you know, pictures were like, you know, three by three, right? They were pretty small, um, but then they started growing and I started seeing ones that were a little bit bigger, you know, maybe the, the three by four or whatever. Uh, and then we started getting the, the wider screen pictures and stuff. And 
And now we have panoramic uh, or even you know 360, but I, I didn't know how to put a 360 picture on, on the chart here. Um, but I think about that same perspective from a ZVM, right? The fact that I'm, I'm looking at and we're working on dealing with how does somebody in London update the service of a system in, in New York or Singapore? Um, how do I deal with having four sub-channel sets? Uh, how do I deal with having any logical processors and hyper-dispatch going on? Um, how do I look at things like OpenShift um, and infrastructure as a service and uh, all these other things that, that I just feel like the field of vision for the space has widened so much. Um, and I'm excited about it because it opens up new opportunities for us. Um, and new challenges and responsibilities as well. Uh, but I'm encouraged by all that. And I'm encouraged by so many of you taking time to, to listen in today. So I hope you found something of value here. Um, and uh, again, I'll, I'll be around all week. So if you have questions in the chat, I'm sure we'll be talking. Uh, so with that, thank you all very much and, and have a great day. So back to you, De Gonzalo. Thank you very much, Bill. If there are no other questions, I will close the recording now. No questions, then. Oh, one question, Bill. Can I have a common record support for ZVM and ZOS on? So if you mean in terms of, of service or having those two products lined up exactly, um, so the security team for ZVM uh, does align with the RACF ZOS team. Uh, not perfectly, right? Because to some degree, we have different different requirements, right? Um, Brian Hogenbrook, when he speaks later on on the MFA, uh, he can probably go into a little bit more detail of that. Uh, but that, that's a good question. Very good. Thank you all very much.